and all the snows have melted and the river's running high and the warmth of spring has touched the land and summer's in the sky and the river's depths are teeming with the salmon coming home to the mighty roar and rest a gush the mighty roar and rest a gush in the mighty roar and rest a gush the salmon find their home The first thing I'd like to do is uh, thank you, Danal, for agreeing to participate in our governance conversation for the Changing New Brunswick series. Um, if it's okay with you, I'd like to just jump right in and start with, uh, with a general question about governance. And then the question comes from an observation that Dalton Camp made in 1970, and uh, I'll, I'll read you what he wrote. Um, he wrote, while New Brunswick holds a uh, title to sovereign responsibilities under the Constitution, Providence has not provided the means uh, to discharge them. New Brunswick is becoming, save only in the empty language of the Constitution, a ward of the federal state. So Camp's contention uh, essentially is that while New Brunswick may be governable, it may not ever be solvent. Um, do you agree with that? Where I would disagree with Dalton on that is that I wouldn't blame Providence. I would blame national policies national institutions. I don't think it's Providence's fault that New Brunswick um, has had some serious fiscal problems over the years, in 1940s, 1930s, and now. And so blaming Providence is too easy. Um, I, again, I think it's national institutions that haven't worked properly, and I think it's national policies that have not worked properly. And it's very fitting that we should be talking about this, because the school that has brought that point home very forcefully is UNB's Department of History. Uh, professors like Ernie Forbes. Uh, if you read historians from UNB, they they've made uh, they've they've made a major contribution in understanding the impact of national policies on the maritime provinces and New Brunswick. So you start with that. So Providence, we can blame it for all kinds of things. This is not one of them. And so we we don't have the kind of national institutions that work. We 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 have the kind of national institutions that invariably invariably will hurt the maritime promises. Now, people in Ontario and Quebec don't like to hear that because they think, oh, whining mar maritimers. Well, we are whining maritimers because we have reasons to be whining mar maritimers. And until we fix national institutions, it's going to be very difficult because invariably national policies will favor Ontario and Quebec. It's very simple. As we all know, you win government in Canada. If you win Ontario, you win a majority government in Canada. If you win Quebec, if you don't do that, you don't win power and power is what matters. And so we're always going to be sort of on the lookout um, and pulling against gravity because gravity will invariably draw things to Ontario and Quebec because that's where the financial center is, that's where the political power is, that's where the bureaucratic influence is, and on and on and on. So we do have a, a serious fiscal problem. We do have an imbalance between the kind of responsibilities that the province of New Brunswick has constitutionally and the ability to pay. Okay, so what you're saying then is that uh, in the Maritimes anyway, uh, governance and finances are inextricably linked. But are governance and finances not different things and should they not be separated? The point is, in our province, I fear that controlling the public purse, the issue of public finances, will so dominate public policy over the next 15, 15 20 years that governance will be about public finances and how do we deal with the situation that we're now facing. And I think the only way you can deal with it is to draw out best governance practices. I think you can build a foundation to deal with the problem through good governance practices. And by that I mean if we don't involve New Brunswickers, if we don't educate New Brunswickers, if we don't explain the kind of situation that we, that we are facing and the kind of decisions that are being imposed on us or will be imposed on us, if we don't do that, then we're going we're gonna to fall into a, a deadly trap of zero-sum gain, where we'll say, well, we're not going to lose our hospitals because if we do, Karaket will gain one. If we, get, if we go down that road, it's a dead-end road. And so good governance will, will be needed, perhaps even more importantly in the years ahead than in past years, because the decisions are so critical and the potential for conflicts are so great that if you don't have in place a good governance process and if you don't know how to involve New Brunswickers and how to deal with this situation, then we're looking at a very dark period. Okay, uh, can you define for us then what, uh, what you consider good governance to be? Well, several things. I would hope that we would have 
less partisan politics. I would hope that we would respect the public service, and I think we've lost sight of that. I think the provincial public service is demoralized. I think the provincial public service is looking, is searching for a role. I think the, the provincial public service has been bandied about by partisan politicians to such an extent that it doesn't know what its true function is anymore. We used to have, pound for pound, we used to have the best public service in Canada. I recall, I'm of a certain vintage and I can say that, I recall when Rudy Bichot went to Saskatchewan and got the best. Uh, I recall when Dick Hatfield went to Ottawa and got the best. In fact, the Deputy Minister of Finance in New Brunswick became clerk of the Privy Council, federally. I recall when Frank McKenna uh, attached a great deal of importance on a good uh, nonpartisan public service, the Claire Morris of this world. We've lost that. And it's not, here I'm not being partisan. I, I'm saying that both major parties have lost a sense of what, it, what we need, what, what we are talking about when we're talking about a good nonpartisan public service. We appoint deputy ministers now who have no, don't have the background, don't have the public service culture, don't have the skills. What they do have is that they're partisan. They're hacks, excuse the expression, but they are. So when I talk about good, good governance practices, I talk about a good public service. I talk about politicians being less inclined to play partisan politics and speaking truth to New Brunswickers. I think we've lost some of that. Best evidence of that, by the way, was the last election campaign, where both major parties, knowing full well, knowing full well the kind of fiscal situation the province was in, tried to outbid one another to win power. I mean, they made outlandish campaign commitments that they knew, and I knew, and I think most New Brunswickers knew that they could ill afford, but they went ahead. They went ahead, not, not in, in, in the interest of New Brunswick. It was in the political interest of their party to gain power, to get access to these jobs, to satisfy some hacks roaming around for it. I'm a bit harsh, but I feel very passionately about good governance, and so allow me that. Um, good, uh, good governance also means reaching out to New Brunswickers. It means explaining you know, to, in a non-partisan way the kind of difficult policy choices that we're confronting. That's what good, just decency, transparency, respect, and information, that's what makes good governance. The other big structural precedent, of course, for governance change in New Brunswick uh, was equal opportunity. So what might politicians and public servants uh, look to in terms of what the Louis Robichaud government did to institute EO in New Brunswick? If I may say, Tony, that's a very good question. And it's a very good question because there were so many lessons learned. Here's one. First lesson, Robichaud said, I have a very ambitious program. Here. I'm not sure about the nuts and bolts, how to make it work, but I know the general outline of what I want to do. So what am I going to do? I'm going to get the best public servant I can get. I'm going to apply the merit principle. I'm not going to appoint hacks. I'm going to go and get professional public servants to come and help me. And look at the ones that, that he brought in. Don Tansley, Don Junk, those very, uh, Graham Clarkson and all, some career public servants that came and helped build the program. So that's lesson one. Lesson two, Louis Bichot, if he had anything, he had political courage. He, he had political will. He said, this is where I'm going. This means something to me, to my province. This is what New Brunswick needs. I'm going to barrel ahead, and I'm going to stake my political future on it. If I win, we win. If I lose, EO is out the door. So it was clear political will, political courage, going out and explaining what EO is all about. So if you get political will, political courage, and a sound public service, professional public service, then you have a good chance of having good public policy. If one of those elements is not there, it's not going to work. Fair enough, but uh, what can be learned from the partisan public response to EO? I'm thinking particularly of the, uh, the quite vehement negative response to it and the political forces that were marshaled against it. But what did Louis do? Louis confronted it. Louis went head to head uh, with these people and confronted and fought them, tooth and nail, out in the hustings, out in Charlotte County, not just in Kent County, but out in Charlotte County, Gloucester County, the rest of it, throughout the province of New Brunswick, and explained what he was trying to do. And he won. So the negative forces, as you would put it, lost, because Louis did it the old-fashioned way. He used political courage, political will, and trusted New Brunswickers to make you know, to make the right decision. He often said that when he went out, he said, I trust New Brunswickers. I'm here to explain what we're planning to do, and I trust New Brunswickers that they'll make the right decision. We can go back and do that. And I think the next 10, 20 years are going to be as critical as the 1960s. 
I agree, and I, I think we'd all like to believe that we can accomplish the kind of uh, structural changes that Rubbish Show did, but uh, didn't the last government try something similar with self-sufficiency? Uh, it was it was the right agenda. It was poorly managed and 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 poorly grown. I mean, at the end of the day, the self-sufficiency agenda. I think the only one that became self-sufficient, self-sufficient. I don't want to be too cynical here, but liberal-leaning lawyers, consultants, lobbyists became self-sufficient. As for the rest of New Brunswickers, it didn't work. Um, I'd, I'd just like to change uh, focus a little bit and, and ask for your thoughts on citizen fatigue and citizen cynicism in regard to that. Because not only do I think that those are at an all-time high in New Brunswick, uh, but also counterproductive to the energies that are required for, uh, for citizen engagement. There is a level of cynicism in Anglo-American democracies that in my view is quite worrisome. And there's a number of reasons for it. I think we have overloaded citizens with information. I think we have structured our political institutions to become blame machines. That's what they do. That's what Parliament does. That's what the Assembly in Parliament does, is to seek out blame, to blame. We have this great desire to blame someone for anything. So we've given the public sector a bad reputation. It's been somewhat deliberate. I think bureaucracy has given the public sector a bad reputation, in part because it's been battered about, in part because it doesn't know if it's, it ought to remain nonpartisan public service or should be catering to the political hacks. It hasn't quite sorted it out because it's been put in that, you know, in that kind of situation. So we have the ingredients of a cynical society. And I think we need to step, step back and look at the blame machine and look how we can fix this blame machine because that's what government has become that's what parliament and legislative assembly have become and over the next 10 years the notion of blaming is not going to work in the province of New Brunswick the, the challenges are far too great instead of pointing the finger and blaming I think we need to point the finger and say okay how, what do we do now what do we do now in healthcare? Uh, in the interest of the blame machine let me blame a few if I can if I can go against my grain of thought uh, several weeks ago, uh, Mike Murphy, who was a former Minister of Health, had an op-ed in the daily newspaper in the province saying that we ought not to close a single hospital and saying that public servants in his department came forward with all kinds of recommendations to close hospitals. Two things wrong with that. Two things desperately wrong with that. One is that if you're not going to close a single hospital, tell us how you're going to deal with a billion dollar deficit. You can't have it both ways. Two. For a minister to come forward and say, the bureaucrats tried, tried this on me. The bureaucrats wanted me to do this. And I said, no. That's not the way our system is to work. The Westminster parliamentary system, our public service should be anonymous. We ought not to identify. Because if we do, we make them political actors. It's very easy to find out which public servant made that. You just go back into history and see who was the deputy minister, who was the ADM, and say, oh, those characters wanted to close hospitals. Well, that's wrong. You don't, you don't build a nonpartisan public service if you go down that road. So we've, we, we, are, we have a cynical population because we've given rise to all kinds of conditions that point the way to, sing, to, to being cynical. Yeah, I agree. I mean, blame seems to be everywhere. Um, and if, in fact, the blame game has eroded public trust, um, like what are your thoughts in terms of how we might reform the image of the public service? I think it's incumbent upon public servants to speak truth to policy issues, to tell ministers what they may not want to hear, to tell ministers this is the situation. You may not like it, but this is, this is, how, this is how it is. To tell a minister, your idea may, may make sense politically, but for the good of the promise, it doesn't work. We've tried that 10 years ago. It doesn't work. Let's not go down that road. The ability to speak truth to ministers and to the premier is an essential part of good governance. Okay, still with citizen engagement and structural reform, uh, can I ask for your views on proportional representation, which seems to be getting a lot of, uh, a lot of headlines lately? Well, I don't think PR, I'm, I've never been a fan of PR, and uh, I don't think it would work um, for several reasons. First, uh, I don't think Canadians are a fan of PR. It's been tried. We've had some referendums in two or three provinces, and in all instances, it was voted down. Second, there are countries who've embraced it, like New Zealand, and what we've seen is that a lot of reform movements have come to a grinding halt because you don't have the kind of stability and the kind of uh, key decision-making processes that you have when there's a majority government. The question, of course, is PR, is it 
could you ever possibly have a majority government? And if, if you live constantly in a minority situation, can you have any kind of long-range planning? At the moment, with majority government's four-year planning cycle, we have a great difficulty in having long-range planning cycles. Imagine it if, if you have PR and a lack of stability. So I've never been in favor of it, and I think the province of New Brunswick is at a critical point. And I think what it needs now is uh, being short-footed and having a capacity, uh, capacity to look long-term. With regards to looking long-term, uh, one concern expressed by many citizens in letters to the editors of the provincial dailies is about the close relationship between business and government in New Brunswick. Um, these letters cite the efforts of uh, recent governments to create business-friendly tax and, and labor policies as one of the sources of people feeling really kind of disenfranchised. So is there any merit in your view to this citizen concern or is, it this, uh, or, or is this feeling uh, kind of a populist example of our tendency toward parochialism? There is merit. There is no question there is merit. It's not just a New Brunswick phenomenon. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the global nature of the economy. I think it has a lot to do because uh, as we try to compete, uh, invariably we have to shed a number of things that we had in the past. But uh, also it has a lot to do with the weakening of the institutions that we have, or our political institutions, our public service institutions. We've, uh, again, we've made Parliament a blame machine. We made the Legislative Assembly a blame machine. We made the public service weak. We've weakened it. So if we weaken those parts, and if what matters now is the individual, that's where you, where if you're looking for power, that's where you go, and institutions don't matter as much, well, you, if you're a powerful individual, you can get access. If you're a powerful individual and you don't have access, you can buy access now. We have lobbyists roaming the streets of Fredericton, for God's sakes. We have lobbyists roaming the streets of Ottawa. And so we've, we've personalized everything. And in doing so, we've disenfranchised people who don't have access, who don't have the, the kind of resources that you need to have access. So is there a merit in the argument? Absolutely. Okay, I'd like to, I'd like to shift gears just a little bit, uh, Danal, and ask you a question that's near and dear to my heart. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll pose it in this way. Uh, when, when Norm Betts lost his Southwest Miramichi seat in, in the 2003 election, he observed that there's a, um, a huge urban-rural thing developing in New Brunswick, and he started calling it the prosperity gap. Um, and he, he wasn't alone, actually, in thinking that the prosperity gap developing between rural and urban New Brunswick would become uh, the big concern in the province. Um, he actually said it would, it would replace language as the new wedge issue. So I'd like to ask you to comment on that little bit of what I consider to be political clairvoyance. Um, specifically on whether or not the gap between the, uh, between the rich and the poor, that is the, the urban south and the rural north in New Brunswick, has created the uh, conditions for another round of equal opportunity in the province. Um, that's a very difficult question, Tony. And I've had an experience of late. Um, a few months ago I tabled a report for Premier Dexter on economic development in the province of Nova Scotia. In that report, I underlined the importance of Halifax as the urban center for the maritime provinces, and we should all applaud its growth. We should take pride as maritimers that Halifax is a major urban center. And uh, uh, the reaction in Cape Breton to my report in rural parts of Nova Scotia was quite visceral. And it's become a very, very, very emotional issue. And I suspect that in New Brunswick, though you see communities dying, they're dying out of bitterness. They're dying out of despair. They're dying out of, if it weren't for Moncton, St. John and Fredericton or Halifax, we would be better off. I don't think that's the case. I think that's the nature of the new economy. That's the nature of the knowledge economy, that it favors urban centers. And it's unfortunate, but that's reality. I grew up in a small village that's now dying as you did, except that you grew up in a town. And it saddens me. Now, as I, if people had taken the time to read what I wrote in my report in Nova Scotia, there was a big part on rural development. And we cannot, we cannot let rural New Brunswick die. We cannot let rural Nova Scotia die. We cannot let rural Canada die. 
Why is that? Well, it, it, it's still the place where we garner the foodstuff. It's still the place where we have tremendous success stories. You know, the McCains were born in a small town. The Irvings were born in Boktush. Small towns have given rise to all kinds of incredible economic successes. That's factor number one. Factor number two, you cannot empty a, a public infrastructure place and say, well, too bad. Just let it go. We invested all these monies to build these roads, these hospitals, this public infrastructure, but the market forces was wipe it clean. It's short-sighted. It is totally short-sighted. Now, are there solutions? Yes, there are solutions. There are solutions. I marvel. I marvel at, 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 at the reason why we in Canada think that all administrative units that processes programs should be in Ottawa or Fredericton. Why is that? Why do we need, why, why couldn't we have the Medicare processing unit um, in Dalhousie? Why could we not have an administrative unit under Revenue Canada and there's what, 40, 50,000 people working there? Why couldn't we have a unit located in Dalhousie? That's one way. Why could you not have a tax structure that would favor rural growth? Why can't we do that? There's all kinds of ways of doing it, and I think we need to do that. Bearing in mind that urban centers are tremendously important for an economy, as it is for the maritime provinces. I, I, I worry, as a lot of people do, uh, about the choices, the hard choices that have to be made in this kind of a f uh, fiscal environment. And Danelle, as you know, I'm very suspect of the zero-sum game, that view that, um, especially in recessionary times, uh, what's given in one area in terms of service or stimulus must be taken away from another area in exact proportion. Uh, I'm suspect of the idea because, it, uh, because of pre-existing structural biases that, in my view anyway, predetermine outcomes in, er in every zero-sum negotiation. So my question to you is, are there, are there alternatives to the zero-sum game? That is, um, alternatives to the thinking that if the Trachety Hospital, let's say, receives X amount of dollars, so must the same amount be taken from uh, a Camelton, let's say, a Camelton School District or a Rishabukto Seniors Home? Well, Tony, if there's no alternative to a zero-sum game, we're all in trouble. I don't think zero-sum game is a solution for New Brunswick. I don't think zero-sum game is a solution for Canada. I totally do not. What's the alternative? Well, there are two alternatives. is having sufficient resources to avoid zero-sum game, unlikely. Second solution, it may sound trite or simple, but as it, it is a solution, is transparency. We need to inform, educate New Brunswickers on the challenges ahead. We need to explain to New Brunswickers that the 30-some hospitals are not going to survive. How do we rationally, without tearing communities apart, without tearing each other apart, without starting urban, rural, English-French war, how do we do that sensibly so that everybody sees merit and you know, people are going to get, some communities are going to get hurt, are going to be hurting. But how do we do it in a proper, in a proper way so that it doesn't fall into a zero-sum game? The minute we do that, then I fear all is going to be lost. Yet we still have our challenges. Uh, for one, you've identified a deep-rooted partisanship and our looming fiscal, uh, fiscal calamity as the big problems we must overcome in this province. So maybe as a kind of final summary question, uh, I, I, I'll ask, um, where do we start and uh, how do we begin? I would embrace a nonpartisan professional public service. I would re-engineer government. I would say to the public service, we have a challenge, you're part of that challenge. These programs ought not to be delivered in the way they've been delivered. So we need to rethink how we deliver programs. We need to, um, there are many things that we do that we ought not to be doing. Um, um, we need to rationalize a number of programs. Do we, do we really need another university, Grandville University in the province of New Brunswick? We can ask those fundamental questions. Um, do we, how do we, uh, how can we uh, go out and, and a word that people would not like, but how do we rationalize university programs? How do we rationalize schools? How do we provide top level health care at uh, three quarters of the cost? How do we deal with medical doctors and their salaries? 
how do we, um, how can we close a hospital? There's a hospital in my community, in, uh, in Saint Anne de Kent, that it has really become an economic engine. It's there because it provides jobs and it's a symbol of that community. Well, can we still afford that symbol? You talk about a blueprint, let's define one, but let's consult New Brunswickers and let's not spring a surprises on them. We can't walk into this crisis and pretending that all is well, and then in two years from now, the financial markets from New York will come down and say, you will eliminate this, you will cut that. That is what I fear. And if we go down that road, the financial markets will rationalize it for us, then you run the risk of conflicts between English, French, urban, rural. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to avoid. Well, thanks again, Danelle, for your time and your thoughts on these important questions. I, I think I can speak on behalf of many in saying that I, too, hope we never have to face that situation. When all the snows have melted and the river's running high And the warmth of spring has touched the land and summer's in the sky and the river's depths are teeming with the salmon coming home to the mighty roar and rest a gush. The mighty roar and rest a gush in the mighty roar and rest a gush. The salmon find their home. For day and toast they celebrate the passage to the Ney. The natives are Campbellton, the festival and Ney. Joies au bon salon at the Belle Riviere. Le festival à Campbellton est tout plein de bonheur. Le festival à Campbellton est tout plein de bonheur.